All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining another installment of the Black Doc Talk series from the Young Black Physicians, better known as YBP. Uh, we're here to celebrate Juneteenth, and in that spirit, we will be covering the topics of collective pain, trauma, historical and present day injustices, impact on our mental health, and we'll be talking about how do we protect our mental health. Uh, but before we do that, I want you to take an opportunity to like, subscribe, click on our channel, social media channels being YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. So allow me to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Nicholas Fletcher, and I will be your moderator for today's conversation. I'd like this opportunity, take this opportunity to handle some housekeeping and I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Elizabeth so she can bring you up to speed. Thank you. Okay, so like Dr. Nicholas said, welcome and good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for once again for one of our events. Um, a few disclosures that we have to give. So we are not receiving any gifts or payments from uh, any companies, uh, health institutions, or any other private or public institutions for today's event. All the information shared here will solely reflect the views of the panelists, and this will include the panelists' research of nationally available information as well as the panelists' own personal experiences. Uh, the views expressed in this video are not a representation of our associated institutions, and this is not to be taken um, as medical advice when we're talking about anything about mental health. Uh, and then all content, including text, graphics, images, and information contained on or available through this platform is for general information purposes only. As always, please, talk to um, your PCP or your doctor if you have any questions uh, that stem from this uh, discussion tonight. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth, very good. And so my name again is Dr. Nicholas Fletcher. I am a resident physician in psychiatry working here in the Detroit area. I originally hail from New Jersey, South Jersey for all that know, that are in the know. I uh, did my undergrad at Howard University, did my medical degree training or went to medical school, I guess you could say at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. And again, I'm here now practicing in the uh, Detroit area. Hello. My name is Dr. Janelle Lee Allen. I am a gastroenterology fellow at this time in Detroit, Michigan, originally born and raised in Harlem, Harlem world, baby. And I am from undergrad, uh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, Wayne State uh, University for my School of Medicine. Uh, and then for internal medicine residency, I went to The Ohio State University and then came back here to Wayne State for my gastroenterology fellowship. All right. My, my name's Tati. I'm currently from the Washington, D.C. area. I did my undergrad at the University of Maryland in College Park. I went to medical school at Abilene University. It's in the Caribbean. Um, currently, right now, I'm completing my internal medicine residency here in Detroit. Hi, I'm Latoria Ellison. I am from Detroit. I completed my undergraduate at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, and medical school at Wayne State University. And I am currently finishing a residency in family medicine here in the Detroit area. Yeah, so I'm Dr. Elizabeth Johnson. I'm from Virginia Beach, Virginia. I went to the University of Virginia for undergrad and then made my way up to Philly uh, for medical school. I went to Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. I then came out to Detroit for my residency where I completed a residency in pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Michigan. And I am now a pediatric attending in the greater Metro Detroit area. Damn. Hello, my name is Dr. Ann Dotti. I am a New Jersey native. I went to Montclair State for undergrad, records for med school, and now I'm here in the Detroit area training also in pediatrics. All right. Hey, guys. Uh, so my name is Dr. Chinamel or Mamel, uh, Donald Decoyer. So I was born and raised in New York. I went to undergrad in City College of New York. I uh, studied or did my medicine, uh, medical training in Tony Downstate uh, in Brooklyn. I went to Detroit, um, practicing uh, in, doing my residency in DMC, Detroit Medical Center, uh, in um, uh, internal medicine and pediatrics. Currently practicing as an attendant now in Staten Island, New York. 
Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Lauren Uroda and I am from Detroit, Michigan, and I love my city very much. Uh, I went to undergrad at Wayne State, I did my med school training at Wayne State, and then I stayed and did my residency with uh, <laughs> Wayne State DMC. I specialize in family medicine and I'm currently practicing in Clawson. Thank you. And together we make up your YVP Black Talk panel. Oh, get it, everybody. <laughs> throw, some sound, throw some sound effects in there, you know, do, do what we do. Um, so yeah, so we're here to celebrate Juneteenth. And I hope that by the end of this, we'll be able to put into context the importance of Juneteenth, what that has, the impact it has had on us as Black people, because we are beautiful, we are resilient, and we do all things. But that also comes with um, some trials, tribulations, and challenges. Um, so what I would like to do first, I would like us to really, you know, Tell me, what is Juneteenth? Like, what are we, what are we celebrating? So I think I'll, I'll take that uh, lead from you, uh, Dr. Nicholas. Um, I think that most people, if you ask uh, people around the country, uh, when did slavery end, most people would probably say with the Emancipation Proclamation. And that isn't true, right? Um, uh, President Lincoln uh, issued the Emancipation Proclamation January 1st of 1863. Uh, but many... <clears throat> Uh, enslaved people or enslaved uh, Blacks still did not know that they were free uh, until two years later. So I'm just going to read a little blurb from the Smithsonian. It said, freedom finally came on June 19, 1865, when some 2,000 Union troops arrived in Galveston Bay, Texas. The Army announced that the, that the more than 250,000 enslaved Black people in the state were free by executive decree. This, came, this day came to be known as Juneteenth, by the newly freed people in Texas. Um, and then even after that, just a little quick history, um, even though that went down, the 13th Amendment still had to be uh, you know, signed um, uh, really to abolish slavery, slavery altogether. Um, and that also came in at the end of 1865. I believe it was in December. Um, okay. And so we are, you know, we're here celebrating, you know, the that the quote unquote end of slavery, but even in that context, we we there's still some uneasiness ar around that, right? But it it is important that we recognize that you know we are celebrated for our resilience. I mean, we as a as a as a black people to be here now present means we are the lucky ones. We are we are actually some of the few who have made it through, you know, years of being bought, sold, you know, beaten, um, disenfranchised, we're here and we should be celebrated. And, and I, wanna, I wanna bring that into context and say that that's, you know, that's what Juneteenth is about. Um, having said that, you know, we celebrate our culture and we celebrate all these beautiful things, but we also carry this, 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 these, these traumas. So when we talk about collective trauma, we are actually referring to, um, we're talking about the impact a stressful or scarring experience can have or, and how it affects entire groups of people, communities and societies. Um, and, you know, just to be clear, it, it's just not slavery. It, you know, it can be, it can happen to the Jewish community with the Holocaust. It can happen with the Asian American community when the internment internment camps uh, during World War II. Um, it, it is a, a jarring experience that kind of alters the reality of how you as a person and you as a, as a race interact with the world around you, right? So that, so that collective trauma can impact relationships. It can alter policies. It can change governmental processes and also the way society functions and even changes our social norms. Like, I think that, you know, previously you had kind of assembled some of the facts and figures um, mm -hmm. of, um, you know, the experience um, of Africans here in America who are now African-American or uh, coming straight from the continent. And, you know, I've always heard this figure of, you know, 
uh, 15 million enslaved um, of our African ancestors who died, um, who lived and died in bondage. And also this other figure that I've always heard of, you know, that's not to even count, you know, the millions um, that died in the, ver in the Middle Passage, um, in the journey uh, to come from Africa to North and South America. Um, you know, and that's estimated something like 30 million people. Um, so, you know, the Middle Passage was such a, you know, massive worldwide, um, you know, unfortunately system, you know, mm -hmm. um, system of oppression, um, system of colonialism. Um, and it impacts us in such a large way, even today, you know, it's not over. Um, mm -hmm. And then also just talking about, you know, even after slavery, the idea of talking about lynching and how just, uh, I think two years ago um, in 2019 uh, for the quad centennial, meaning 400 years after 1619, um, there was a whole movement to talk about, you know, once we got uh, to the lands of America, you know, you know, what are some things that we've endured, you know, but there is mm -hmm. a museum even dedicated to lynching um, that thankfully, you know, um, has opened and it's a trip to see let this never happen Hello. again. Um, yeah. so, you know, it's, you know, there's many things that we have to, to remember, lest we forget, you know, um, but those are just some things that kind of float in my mind and, and, and really to just kind of bring it forward, Nicholas, I don't know if you want to, you know, kind of just, uh, name some of those statistics that talk about yeah. home ownership and how that impacts our generational wealth, um, generational poverty, um, and generational, uh, you know, economics. Right. When you look at things like home ownership, Black Americans, 43.4% versus white Americans, 72%. You know, where does that come from? Why, why the disparity? Unemployment, 20, in April 2022, Black workers, 5.9%. White, 3.1%. Where, why the disparities? Maternal, mater, maternal mortality of Black women, 2.9 times higher and white women, why the disparity? Um, so, those so being the physicians that we are, you know, I I think it's important to start with like at the at at like our personal level when we talk about the stress and the trauma and all that that goes into it. Um, you know, at a cellular level, there's research that shows that you actually change the way that your genes and your genetics, the, the stress, the cortisol that is produced, you actually change in a way, um, you know, you can almost compare it to like Darwinism where it's survival of the fittest. And so we are trying to protect ourselves. And so we, we release these, this cortisol, we change our, our, our genetics in a way that helps protect us. But at the same time, that's not supposed to be something that's sustained. We're not supposed to mean this in this heightened sense of fight or flight is what we call it. We're not supposed to be in this heightened state of I'm always on, you know, when you, when you walking around and you may be going down, you know, you may be in a spot, you, you're not feeling too comfortable. You're, you have this heightened sense of awareness. That is what it's been like to be black in America for the last 400 years, to be in this sense of fight or flight. And, and imagine what that does to you. It's tiring and it's draining. And it is something that we carry every time we walk out the door. Um, and so we, we, we tend to lean into like, that's just our culture, that's just what we do. Um, but I, I would argue maybe it's a little different, maybe it's more than that. What do you guys think? I uh, see if I could jump in a little bit there, even in the way we respond physically as a body, our mind, although it's not something we can hold tangibly, um, it is a part of our body and our makeup. And so I think one way that we see this collective trauma manifesting in our individual thought patterns is in the way we view ourselves. Um, I think of, I was working with a patient who's a young child and, you know, in 2022, you think that the world, you can do anything, any opportunity, any of, of you know, whatever you would cho choose to aspire to is available. Um, but walking in the room and was surprised to see that their physician looked like them. And when I realized that, I thought this is what, eight, nine, 10 year old school age child in 2022, who's already developed this mentality of survival versus a mentality of thriving because um, of just what they've experienced in their short time span of life. Um, so I think in addition to like our body actually living in the heightened state of uh, physical stressors, there's some mental, um, ramifications of that that we can see even in our children. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And then, and so we, we tend to normalize some things that may not actually be healthy for us in our culture. You know, I mean, we may tend to just say it's okay to, you know, be a little harder or be a little harsher or be a more, a little insensitive. Um, and, you know, I, I wonder if that's that learned behavior, how far back does it go? You know, I mean, the, like, you know, my, when I see that, you know, I ask, why is this happening? Why are we doing this the way that we do it? And what do you? You know, I think that kind of, when you mention that, that speaks to kind of like intergenerational trauma, right? This idea that, um, you know, trauma is passed down. It's also, you know, it's passed down through the stories we tell, through our collective knowledge um, and shared experience. I remember growing up and hearing of stories of my own, you know, like a, a family member of my own who was lynched, you know, and who was basically two generations from me. Um, but if we don't talk about it in, in a safe place, and a collective place that we all may come to consensus about, you know, what is true and what has happened. A lot of times you get these pockets um, where things are very uh, disoriented from what they, what, what really happened. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's something that's very um, critical to be able to have a great grandparent tell you like, no, I was there. I was a kid and this is what happened. And this is what I remember. Um, even sometimes watching the documentaries about Emmett Till, you know, his, that the, you know, the cousin who he grew up with um, and who, you know, was in the same room as him when they pulled him from um, the evening was able to say, you know, we were, you know, ex, you know, nine and 10 years old. So I knew what was happening, you know, and all the things and how fearful we were and being able to really hear um, the truth of that. And again, we weren't alive, um, but knowing that experience saying, you know, again, that building up that fighter spirit to say, you know, this has got to change and, and this can't happen again. Right. I, I feel like things have, um, if you talk to different generations, they would have different things to say, right? If you talk to um, like my parents, like the civil rights movement was still raw. Right. So um, their conversations were differently. And then as you moved along, um, people, and I'm just going to go ahead and say it, white people um, would like to uh, not speak on it. Right. So when forced to confront the identity, white identity and racism, it makes people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's just kind of like, well, this is easier just not to talk about it. And you should just accept that too. No, that's not that's not easier for anybody. It's not comfortable. Or the the usual argument is, I didn't own any slaves, so what does that have to do with me? But the things that were put in place during slavery are still affecting us today. The things that came about during the Reconstructive Era are still are still affecting us today. Things that came about during Jim Crow still affect us today. Um, but what we would like to move towards, I, I think that people like to move towards um, right now in this new generation. What I see is the color blindness. Right? Um, I I don't see race. I don't see any of that. I I don't know what you're talking about. When really denying that we have our differences is almost an insult. Yeah. So that's that's one part. I don't know if I'm jumping all over the place, but I feel like um, that's something that's a, that is really frustrating about our history here in America um, and just confronting white identity and racism. Yeah. No? Anyone else? So, um, for me, um, certain things when it comes when you brought it like the systemic racism, um, you know, I recall being told um, about how like prisons are being built based on um, the number of African American men in like second and third grade, and you're like, well, well, how is that possible? But then when you look at the statistics and say that, okay, well, we make up 12 percent of the population, but 33 percent of the in prison population, um, which is just staggering like how do we get to this point how do we get away from this point um and back to what you're saying um is that we're not ready to have those conversations we try we have these events we have these events um online we have them in our different institutions um and we talk a great game but if everyone is not willing to really put in the work to make those changes we're going to continue to have these problems 
I definitely want to add to that. You know, I feel like 2020 was such a powerful year, right? Because 2020 had COVID and in the midst of all of, um, you know, the health, health inequities, um, our strive and our struggle, even as YBP, you know, that is exactly our mission um, is to facilitate uh, all of the opportunities to to achieve health equity, right? Particularly for marginalized communities because of all the disparities that we saw, you know, all the different health conditions, you know, um, you know, and people wanted to point it as race. Oh, well, black people have more hypertension, black people have more diabetes, black people have more obesity, da, 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 da. And yet we wanted to treat that as, you know, if race actually has a true biological um you know, impact. It doesn't. It has a social impact, right? It, you know, why we have all of these conditions really deal with from when we first stepped into the Americas, right? The idea of not getting health care from the very beginning as an enslaved people, the idea of getting fit at poor diets, if any at all, the idea of getting, um, you know, not getting treatment for any Medicaid, you know, for any particular conditions. And then also the idea of not having enough, you know, economics, because in order to eat healthy, to live in a healthy environment and in a healthy zip code, because there is, there are differences between, uh, you know, if you live in one zip code for the other in lifespan, but sometimes by 10 years, um, if you look at some of the Hopkins reports. So the bottom line is, you know, all of our conditions and why we have such many of our health inequities is really a measure of all of our social impacts or social determinants of health. And racism is one of the prime key things. The director, uh, the uh, past director of um, the American Association of Public Health, Dr. Kamara Jones, speaks so intently. You can just Google her name and she talks so much and breaks down so many reasons why, you know, race racism is a determinant, a social determinant of health that drives all these other economics, you know, uh, unemployment, um, you know, uh, education, all of these things are driven by, you know, our systematic racism, right, and how we've been treated all throughout history. Um, and I really feel like 2020 brought that to the surface, but then 2020 also brought to the surface the idea of so many different um, uh, racial impacts, particularly macroaggressions that happen on a daily basis from the, uh, you know, the um, Black man who was in Central Park and who was able to so eloquently record this unfortunate, you know, um, biased and, you know, clearly trying to weaponize her understanding of her privilege in America as a white woman um, and basically was falsely accusing this gentleman of harming her because he, she thought that he should do whatever she asked him to do. Yeah. Um, right or wrong, because she understood in in our society, it is still in many ways based on a white supremacist system. I am a white woman, and I should be able to tell you what to do and what I don't want you to do at any given time. And if you don't, I know that our society doesn't really, you know, see you as valued. So I can call the police on you, and they can then turn, point the finger at you, and say, "Yes, you were in the wrong." But it exposed that because for so many times that, you know, we grow up and particularly if you're growing up in a lot of black circles, we talk about it amongst ourselves all the time. But the conversation never necessarily extends to our um, the company that is not, you know, black. You know, we right. don't necessarily hear that in conversation. We don't hear that on white shows. Um, right. And as, you know, Dr. Uh, Liz brought up, it, sometimes it's because people want to hear no, you know, see no evil, hear no evil. But the truth is, it's there. So I feel like 2020 also brought to the surface, um, it, it pulled back the curtain and it stopped gaslighting. The same way people were trying to say that COVID wasn't real and then it would hit their state and they'd be like, oh my gosh, COVID is so real. <laughs> is the same way that we were able to say, oh, and you guys, you know, people say racism isn't real or that we don't deal with this on a daily basis. But yet here it is, you know, from Ahmaud Arbery to um, George Floyd and being able to have these footages to be able to say like, no, black people are still going through very mm -hmm. severe racist issues. Even the most recent
recent, you know, mass shooting. He streamed that to be able to see that this gentleman, unfortunately, was an 18 year old young mind who, again, probably was in this pocket of, you know, propaganda about white supremacy and what he deserved and all this entitlement mixed in, I'm sure, with probably some forms of mental illness where and he took to act and took lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm going to stop there because I'm going to give somebody else to talk. But I'm just saying, so, 2020 was a heck yeah. of a year. And part of it was because it brought to the whole world stage right. um, racism on a daily basis that still continues, um, as well as health inequities. So, first of all, yes, we f I feel you. We feel you. <laughs> so I'm just going to I'm just going to give that a moment. I'm going to let it sink in. OK. And we'll, what I want to do is because some people may take what you said and interpret it when I say people, probably people not on this, uh, not listening to us, but they will they will assume that 2020 was just a one off like 2020 was just a year like it was COVID. It was you know, we just people were sitting around with no jobs. And so they just had more time to pay attention to this stuff. So that's why it was, this, you know. And I would argue maybe there was, maybe this has been bubbling for a while. You know, we, we, we people have to go to work. People, you know, when, when you leave the house and you go into the world as a black person, you're constantly being accosted with racism. And my question is, does it always have to be a macro aggression? So no, we have um, racial microaggressions. Um, for those who are watching, they don't know what uh, a microaggression or specifically a racial microaggression is. Um, they're brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities. I'm reading this definition. Whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults towards people of color. Um, so a uh, perfect example, um, I'll, I'll give, I, I mean, we all, I'm sure have several, <laughs> um, but one that, um, I had, um, from, uh, growing up, uh, you speak so well, or my favorite was, um, you are just like an Oreo cookie. You're black on the outside, but white on the inside because I speak so well. Mm. Um, that's that one. Um, that, and that's from childhood, right? That's from childhood. Um, and, and just pushing that idea of that because I'm black, that it's such, it's such a surprise. Wow, that she's intelligent, that she's articulate. You don't sound like a black person. Right, and, and um, my parents were very, uh, shout out to my parents, were very good of um, letting me know that blackness is not homogenous. Um, not everybody is one way. That's the first part of it. Two, don't let um, polite bigots, okay, that's how my parents would put it, or whether they're polite or not polite, put you in this box. Mm -hmm. This is not what Blackness is. I'm not confined to your box. And even sometimes, and then as an adult, I've even had to call out Black people, our own people, of being like, hold up. Do you not realize what you just said is colonialism or white supremacy coming out of your mouth, right? Things that you have been, have been forced onto you and have been passed along that you somehow think that this is norm, no. So that's that part. And then one, even as an adult, I had, um, so everybody in the group knows I have big curly hair um, right now it's wrapped because uh, I didn't do it. But anyway, um, I remember I was walking uh, in the hospital. I was minding my business and on the way to get lunch um, and someone shouted out to me because this was the first time I wore my hair out. Oh, wow. Is that how you feeling today? And I said, that's how Jesus felt when he made me. If you have a problem with it, then maybe you should talk to him, not me. I really said that right off the right off the fly because you wouldn't say that to anyone else. This is my this is how. Um, and then even last year, uh, someone said that to me as an attending. 
in the office, uh, a, a older woman said to me, you know, your hair, it's just so big and, and just, it's just out of control. I would never be able to, to just wear my hair like that. It's just, you know, it just doesn't look like whatever. And I said, this is literally how God made me. So we, we hear this from the time that we're children or I had, it, it bothered me. I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent. Mm. It bothered me that I had a, um, a four-year-old a uh, little black girl who asked me why my hair was so big. And, and her mom, I said, well, that's how God made, made me. Her mom said, yes, please explain to her that curls and big hair is beautiful. And she said, no, I think it's ugly. I think straight hair is better. What? <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it just trickles down, but I'm sure we all have stories of microaggressions that we deal with on a daily basis and, and it affects you, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'll even, Go yeah, ahead. yeah. Go ahead. sorry, Dr. Jill, um, I'll jump in. I mean, I think that speaks to, uh, I appreciate your story, um, Dr. Elizabeth. I think it speaks to all of our understanding because when you said, oh, you know, you speak so well, everyone on the panel nodded. You know, we all heard that, especially if you're in the position of, um, uh, advanced education, um, you know, you, you, you kind of had to do that. That's because that's what's required for you to get through. Um, and yet when you see it, it's such a huge, you know, it's such a huge um, accomplishment because it's far from expectation and it's outlined, it's, it's given us this spotlight. Um, and that's the problem. It speaks to this general understanding. Okay. It's a very biased understanding. And this again, draws back to this uh, basically collective issue. Um, we collectively understand that we are not supposed to be this way. We are not supposed to uh, achieve these things. Um, we are supposed to be oppressed by this, uh, this group. We're supposed to seek uh, uh, help from this particular group. These are the general understandings that have been pervasive and you know, pushed into our, our, our food, our water, um, and we absorbed it. You know, um, and it's the, the problem is it, it's we we it's very easy to put this onto one particular group, but unfortunately, it's it's become so part of our environment that every group has embraced it, and it as basically um, is is basically expressing and reflecting that. You spoke to that as well, uh, Dr. Elizabeth, how our own people would speak to see us or see an individual who's doing well for himself, or, or you know, going back to the example with the speech. You speak so well. Oh, you're talking really white. You know, you sound white right now. You know, it, it's just those little things. Or if you act empathetic, sympathetic, you know, you're soft. You're not really black. You know, there's, there's just so many little things that come up. Um, and that, unfortunately, that's what we have found um, in our own grouping um, because of what we've been exposed to. And this is, again, this is just a reflection of the trauma. We This is our response to how we've seen the world as is and that's the problem I, I think we really have to figure out we identify what is, it is that we are doing um, that's really important how is it that we're speaking with each other how is it that we are receiving other people how are we reflecting the racism the systemic racism that's in our system all right um, and that's something that we have to do for ourselves but it, it's so important for us because we cannot expect another group unfortunately to do the same but it's and once we figure out for ourselves, we have to then be ready to push and push back and tell the others or, you know, let other people know this is exactly what's happening. All right. Um, really pulling the curtain um, from the issues that are there. But it's only until we understand it for ourselves and in ourselves, can we really make a sense that like Dr. Nicholas, you mentioned, how can we know there's a problem going on unless, you know, if we're ignoring it. We have to identify there's a problem and then from there figure out how to actually uh, address a problem. We must do that, then address and push it to the people who are basically, who've been pushing this particular narrative, okay? Um, and, you know, um, that's, uh, unfortunately, we have to do this fight and we have to take on the onus of doing these things uh, because, unfortunately, it's, doesn't, it, it's never the oppressors who decide to, you know, try to make the change. The, this, the, uncomfort, the discomfort that comes from it, you know, it's just easier to be complacent, unfortunately. Um, and so we have to fight against that. I will, I, will, I will add to that. When the oppressors are the people who are supposed to protect you in society, what are you supposed to do with that? 
when they, when they're the people who are supposed to protect you, you know, law enforcement and alike, what what are we supposed to do with that? What is, so what is that? I mean, the problem is that you can't you can't resign any of your your freedoms or your rights solely to the people who you expect to protect you. Unfortunately, there's been such uh, miscarriages of justice, miscarriages of, of responsibility um, that we've seen countless times. We don't have to get into all the things that have come up, but we 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 see it. Uh, I mean, the thing is that we can't, despite that being the expectation. That we can't, we just like follow the rules, obey uh, the the uh, the word of the authority. Um, we have to be ready to not only understand what the laws are, but ready to defend ourselves, even to people of authority. All right, and and that's unf unfortunately the case. Um, uh, the problem is that we've been uh, we I say because uh, perspective of someone who has been oppressed upon uh, or the the marginalized. Unfortunately, we're coming, having to fight our way up, or we're basically boxing upwards, um, and and it's it's hard to do so. We are not in a position. Not all of us are in a position of, of being resourced, well resourced. We're not in a position of being um, endowed with the right materials and informations to know what we have to fight against. But unfortunately, that's the the responsibility that we have, and. Uh, in great ways, I mean, it shows a stride we pushed. The, the much, the many things that we've gained, the many strides that we made, has come from us actually fighting against these particular oppressors. Um, I mean, I've been pretty broad in general, but I mean, I, I'll, I'll go more personally. Um, I I would like to think I'm a law-abiding citizen. You know, I, I really don't go around doing commit felonies out here, you know. Um, I listen to music that talk about it, you know, I definitely bump it a little bit, but I definitely don't engage or encourage. Um, but uh, um, I mean, I'd like to think, I, in my mind, I thought, you know, because I'm doing all the right things, I'm, I'm you know, I'm in heavy in academics, I'm good, I, I try to be around doing the right things in my community, you know, it sort of just kind of emanates from you, you know, oh, this, this person is doing, this is all right, you know, you can't be concerned about this person um, doing something crazy. Um, but it, it, it's happened to me where I find myself in a position um, being pulled and, and jostled by police um, because I fit a particular description. Um, this was just as early as last uh, two years ago, um, as recent as two years ago, I should say. And, you know, I was walking home from a shift um, from the hospital. I actually was about to head over to the library, uh, changed into my sweats. Uh, was crossing over to, you know, walking over to the library that's near me. Um, and I just had squad cars. One flashed me with huge lights um, while I was on the sidewalk. Three cars just came up on the sidewalk. People just ran out. I couldn't even get a good sense of the numbers. They ran up on me um, before they'd even said a word, um, just basically pulled me um, in, into a resting position. Um, and, and I mean, my mind is racing. I'm not sure what's going on. I, 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 I'm, in my, I'm like, What's going on? Like, what's happening? Do and, it, and all I can think of, know what can happen. Be careful. Don't say anything crazy. I'm, of course, I'm, a, I'm angry. I'm upset. Like, what are you doing? What's going on? But then, and, and then I see people, the hands coming out to the side, and I immediately realize this is not the time. You, you, you can't, you can't be that one. Yeah. So you just have to go into your mental training of survive. Just survive. Don't worry about being. Uh, uh, you know, having your rights taken away. Don't don't be right now. This is not the time to work, to talk about like what they're doing wrong. Just survive. And this is the fear that I think you know many people like myself, you know, look like us have, have been dealing with. And, you know, Dr. Okoye, when you were speaking, it really just hits home that you know it can be overwhelming to feel like how do we conquer something like this. And, and sometimes it's on a big scale and a really traumatic experience like you, you know, went through. Um, but I think to, to even feel like all of us in this conversation, everyone tuning in can feel like they can make an impact to slowly improve this, to, to address these things that we face on a daily day um, is do what you can when you can. And whenever that opportunity strikes, it could be at any moment, any small thing. Um, you know, I've been stopped in the mall by an elderly woman who had her granddaughter and, you know, who wanted just like you, Dr. Johnson, who, who she felt she was ugly and, and she just needed to hear someone, um, who looked like her 
be proud and confident to be black. And I've, I've had even, you know, experiences um, where, you know, I'm in a predominantly white um, demographic right now where I practice. And uh, when there was the school shootings that was uh, happening, the one in Oxford, you know, a, a patient had made a comment about, you know, oh, it was so shocking that it happened, you know, in that nice suburban area. And I had to kind of, you know, that was my opportunity to, I could have, you know, went off a little bit and, but I took that opportunity to educate and say, well, statistically, you know, most, if not all shootings, you know, have been happening in upper suburban, you know, areas that this is not an inner city issue that we've been encountering. So, you know, taking that, oh, you know, and so it was a moment where, yes, I had to kind of put those internal uh, feelings of aggression aside to address and make it a teaching moment that hopefully he'll take and, and pass on. But it's always that trickle effect. You never know when you'll have an opportunity. And just, just being you, just the way you carry yourself when we are, you know, rounding in the hospitals, how you greet people, you know, we are physicians. And I think that takes, that does have an extra responsibility. Um, but if you carry it well, you never know who's, who's looking, who can, who can really just be energized by that because, you know, sometimes you can feel very isolated and not like you have that support. Um, so it is very important to always be vocal, be loud, be proud, you know, and just, um, any opportunity to, to pass that torch is, is super important, super relevant. Uh, Dr. Nicholas, I just, I'm so sorry, uh, you know, I just wanted to say something real quick. Um, Dr. Nicholas mentioned, like, how, um, how can we kind of, like, trust these systems, like, the people who are, are put in place to protect us, you know, how can we trust them when historically they haven't? Um, I, two things, I really, since we're talking about collective trauma, um, when people are shocked when someone of color, especially a Black person, is not trusting of the police, I feel like they don't know their history. So understanding that modern day, modern day policing um, can be traced back to slave patrols, mm -hmm. right? Um, so this was never a system put in place to protect us. That's that one thing. Um, and that has been continued, that bias, um, and really um, a level of terror has been continued through generations. Okay, so that's one thing people can uh, agree or disagree, but those are historical facts if someone's watching. That's mm -hmm. the first part. And then just secondly, how does that uh, affect us? Um, you know, you, you'll have someone uh, come, I, I'll see children in the office and they're like, I wanna be a cop, I wanna be this. And I, I hear that usually from um, white children, um, but I had, and not necessarily black children, uh, I was at a friend's house um, this holiday uh, weekend and they were talking about, um, a couple was talking about how they witnessed a really bad car accident. And so my friend pulled over, um, he had his two children um, in the back and he was with his wife, he pulled over to help um, and try to get the people out of the car. Okay, it was a bad accident. Um, what made me upset or sad, because it's just the reality, is that he said his son, when he heard the sirens coming and the police coming, started crying, is daddy going to get in trouble? Is, are they gonna take daddy away? Sorry, that, it makes me upset because people like to dismiss our trauma and they like to think that our children don't notice this but our children are seeing this. Why does a four-year-old know that, that his dad's life is at risk, possibly if the cops show up? I'm sorry. It just made me angry thinking about that. So and then, and just, it's not the same when people look at the police to protect and serve. I don't see it the same way. I have a fear and I've been pulled over. I have a fear of truly what will happen. I have fear for my brothers. Um, uh, Amel, just like you have been pulled over and stopped, I witnessed that my, my last day undergrad graduation, we're all out celebrating 
and they pull us over, University of Virginia students, and put my friend on the ground. For what? So it's just, these are things that I, I just hate. I truly hate when people try to dismiss our trauma as if it's just not real. I'm sorry. Now I got it. Who knows? I just know that I think that's what my comment that's, was. That's the idea of sometimes people feel like, oh, well, you're experiencing this and I don't know if I can identify. And I think I, I fully disagree. I mean, there are, we are all human. And the idea is if you are truly coming with an open heart, um, and an open mind that it's really about what is your experience, especially as a physician. You know, one of our one of one of my oldest physician mentors, he would say, "What do patients want from you?" And you know, so many times as you know, med students would be like, "The right medicines, the right treatments, the right diagnoses, all of these things." And he and he actually was a psychiatrist, and he was like, "No, patients want you to listen." and to hear what it is that they're going through then you know yes then you can be able to understand what it is that they feel and that is a you know you can do that from a human perspective it doesn't matter if you're not the same color as me i remember someone you know in in, in good intentions they were coming to me um during my medical training when you know i think that was in 2029 when we had a whole rash of uh of um uh, or excuse me, 2019, when we had a whole rash of police brutality um, towards the middle to the end and just saying to me, you know, I'm not black, but I wanna know how you're doing. And I, and I kind of, you know, let them know, like, I appreciate you asking me, but I also want you to know that just because you're not black doesn't mean that it's not impacting you either. Like this should impact us because these are young people who are dying, young and middle-aged people um, who are dying and they're unarmed. This is violence. It's for many different reasons, but it's still violence at its core. Um, and it's what we're seeing. Um, and I always, you know, let people know, like, you know, Black people, like I have Harriet Tubman shirt on right now, we out, um, <laughs> you know, 1849, you know, but amongst many of the abolitionists, there were also white abolitionists, you know, John Brown is one abolitionist that I feel like, you know, you know, to be able to go against at that time, what so many of your own people thought, but to be able to stand and say, no, this is wrong. These are human beings and we are not doing the right thing and we have to fight. So I think, you know, all of us, you know, being able to talk in this kind of forum or through our live chat about these things um, collectively um, so that we can understand that these, you know, definitely impact us. Sometimes we push it down. Sometimes, you know, we say, I don't want to see, you know, the, the newest, you know, slavery kind of, um, you know, TV show because we want to say, I want to forget that. But the mm -hmm. truth is, it's still in us. And we have to talk about this in order for it to get released, in order for it, to, for our feelings, as um, Dr. Liz said, to be validated. Because a lot of times we feel like we're alone. Um, and the truth is, again, we can't be gaslighted. Our trauma is definitely real. And I think that the more it comes to the forefront, the more we, you know, other people understand who are not Black and who can identify. Because this isn't, you know, again, the system of white supremacy and the system that created the Middle Passage went all around the world. There are so many different uh, countries in which uh, you know, light is right, or the closest thing to white is best, and the close and the furthest thing from it is not valued. Um, that can be seen in India, that can be seen um, even in many other Asian countries, um, and in Europe. These are these are just real things, and this really happened to us, and it's still impacting us. Um, I think the only thing I want to add is even when we talk about things, how it affects our mental on a daily basis. I mean, literally, when I go and look for schools for my children, I have to figure out, well, how many Black people are there? Is there, is there, because just because a school is great and it has top honors, but if the population isn't diverse enough, then I, I think to myself, is my child safe there? Yes, it's going to be great for um, the people who are there, but if we put the 
essence, you know, of diversity. If we put, you know, African Americans in a predominantly white institutions, will they be called the N word? You know, will they be talked about their hair? Are, is, how many people are going to try to touch their hair without their permission? How many people are going to try to tell them that, you know, oh, well, you know, I saw your daddy on TV, you know, talking about maybe something in the news and how a black male was featured. So these are all things that as black people knowing our history that we have to understand and that we have to pay attention to all the time. Again, that kind of goes into that cortisol and that stress level and that extra work that we have to do. You're so right, Dr. Janelle, so right. I, I Dr. Janelle, I, you know, when, when you talked about kind of like the global um, impact that the system of oppression, you know, for the last, 400 plus years and you know they, they say a system is what is a system is designed or something uh, system is perfectly designed to give you the results that it gets right and so that's what we've been doing so you have the system in place that is inherently oppressive um and then you have a pandemic and then you have a invisible essentially plague on the on the world and it becomes a almost race for the cure and now we're in a position in this country that we're dealing with all the things that we just talked about and now we have COVID-19 and we have a pandemic. And I feel like I would be remiss if we did not specifically talk to the impact that it has had on, on society, but specifically black people, because it has, it's controlled everything we've done for the last two years. And you know, I, I wonder if anyone can just speak to that and kind of bring it, bring it forward so that we can give context to where we are right now. Um, so I went to the CDC to get some of these um, statistics. So right now with the 2020 census, US census, pretty much there's Caucasians make up about 59.7% and Blacks make about 12.6%. So we're going to do proportions. For every one Black person, there's five Black people. Now with those proportions, if you're African-American, one you're 1.1 more times more likely to get infected with COVID-19 you're 2.4 times more likely to get hospitalized due to COVID-19, and you're 1.7 more times likely to die because of COVID-19. So if everything was equal, we should be getting similar proportions, but you can see that COVID-19 has been attacking at a higher rate to a smaller population, i.e. African-Americans and Blacks, when compared to our white counterparts. And then we just look at the vaccinations. Oh, um, as of today, According to CDC, about 54% of, of Caucasians have received one dose of the vaccination. About 47% of African Americans have. 49% of, of Caucasians are of completely vaccinated, or it's only 41%. So again, the numbers aren't balancing. And you can see there's being swinged in one arm versus the other. And you can see, we all understand what COVID-19 is doing. It's affecting one population a lot more than the other, just so we can look at those statistics right there. And one, one of the things I, I'd like to throw into context and something I've said in the past is that, you know, when, when, when COVID hit, if you are already struggling, if you are already struggling with mental challenges, mental illness, it was exponentially worse during COVID-19. If you were a quote unquote normal person who had to deal with, okay, the entire world is shut down. Everything I knew to be true is now no longer, nah, we're just gonna ignore that for a second. Don't go to work, don't leave your house, don't do anything, you'll be okay. We've li we literally flipped that on its head and expect people to just be okay with it. Um, I think for, for the next 10, 15, 20 years, COVID-19 is gonna be a touch point in people's mental health. Like you're going, to, you're going to want to know what were you doing? How did you deal with being locked down in COVID-19? And that 
lends itself to just the the mental the the mental health impacts that have been affecting our community and made it worse physically and mentally and i i wonder what do what do we do what does that look like? What is that? What is that going to look like? It leaves it with the opportunity for um, panels like this for us uh, to reach out to those because of everything that we've already been speaking on um, today is the lack of trust is what it kind of comes back to. So the systemic racism that um, leaves us in these different disparities. Um, and then like even going back to the fight or flight, like you're always like, I need to defend myself because of all these things that's happened in the past. So now there's no trust. So when we're trying to say that, yes, these vaccines will be great for you. Yes, you need to wear your mask. Um, even coming from us, when we look like them. It's still like, how can I trust this? So it's us still reaching the community in which however we can, um, but it's also like developing those relationships with the community so that they will begin to trust us because we're definitely in this with them. Yeah. And so as we, you know, lean into our communities, we also have to pay attention to individuals in our communities, how we're doing, where where people are, meeting people where they're at. You know, um, you know, we have especially our 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 youth specifically probably bore the the brunt of this more than anyone else, right? Because we were, you know, if you're an adult, you know, you're going to work, you're doing your nine to five, you're doing what you do. Uh, maybe it was virtual, maybe, you know, you could a little bit more relax. Kids, I, I have three and they were forced to be locked down in front of an iPad for four hours at a time plus, sometimes eight. Um, and what does that do? Like, what does that do to their, you know, mental health? And how are those, how do we identify those kids? I think that's a great question. I know personally over the last year of just taking care of children in this area, I mean, anecdotally have seen the increase of children who are overwhelmed, who are struggling with depression, struggling with anxiety, and don't know how to express it or who to express it to. So a lot of times the first time parents are hearing their child say, what I'm seeing in the world around me is affecting me personally and my mental health is when they're in our clinic or admit it to the hospital because they've attempted something that had a permanent solution to um, the, the stress that they were sensing in that moment. Um, just a couple of statistics I know that we've even shared um, last week or a couple of weeks ago um, in Lansing with uh, Michigan, the American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics was talking about mental health um, was that the diagnosis of anxiety increased by 29% and depression by 27% in children ages three to 17. And when you consider the, the increase of one or if one in five youth will have some type of mental health um, condition that requires medical treatment or medical um, professionals to intervene, that's alarming numbers to hear. But I think one thing kind of going into uh, how do we overcome this is that in talking about it, we can provide that avenue to bring healing into to saying to the children and to ourselves, um, like many of us who've already shared stories here is that that was painful, that hurt and not have someone have to say why you shouldn't or why you need to move on. I, I mean, currently I um, have been working with like a child abuse team. And one of the things that um, I found most, uh, what's the word, discouraging was to hear someone share the trauma they went through and hear them say the people who are closest to me don't believe me. And so I think if you're close to someone, especially a person of color who's expressing their trauma is to just say, you know, I believe you. And it doesn't matter if you understand all of the details of it. Don't ask them to unload all of the details and explain everything that they've experienced in their lifetime or that their family has experienced, but allow us to kind of organically say, hey, I went through something. That's as much as I wanna talk about it right now. 
as people of color to know our history and say, hey, why don't you try looking at this resource that can tell you more about it? Because I'm not in the position right now to share it as I'm personally working through this or needing to just take a minute and not be the sole advocate for my entire people group as an individual. So I think a little bit of it is extending that grace and kindness to ourselves as we share with others. And also as we're asking other people to share that we're mindful that, you know, that we need healthy boundaries so that we can establish this care. If you know, someone had a wound in their skin and we're like, hey, that looks like it's gonna hurt. You're not gonna just shove your hand in there. We usually give them an anesthetic first. And then, you know, we say, okay, I'm going to touch. I'm going to pull the Band-Aid. You're going to feel the dressing move. And there's like this process to how we address these painful situations in the physical. And I think collectively, as we do it in society, we have to find those measurements and parameters. How do we address these wounds that have been here in our culture? Um, for an extended period of time. That was good. Hold on, hold on. I gotta, I gotta, gotta let, good. let, I gotta let that, I gotta let that sit for a minute. Just gotta. That was real good, girl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Absolutely, good. absolutely. Um, you know, we we've we've covered a lot, and and we did it, you know, as as succinct as succinctly as we could, um, and. I'd like us to each, you know, I'd like to give everyone an opportunity to speak to one, what is it, when did you identify and notice that you were Black in America? I want to give our audience an opportunity, if they can, to identify with our own lived experience. Um, and so, and with that, kind of Give us some ideas of how you move through the world, some things that you do to keep yourself healthy, keep your, your keep yourself mentally fit. Um, you know, how do you examine yourself to make sure that you're okay? And how do you extend that to others? Um, we can go backwards. <laughs> so we'll start with uh uh, Dr. Lauren. I would say, um, and you know, for a majority of my life, I was in predominantly white schools. So I was, you know, the only black uh, person in my classes. And then as I, as you know, elevated and took more honor classes in college and things that also became more, I became more of an, a minority um, with less and less people that identified with me. And so I feel like in college, though, was really where I, I felt and had experiences where I could see the discrepancies or have more direct racial comments made towards me, about me, um, different stereotypes and things that were, um, and, and kind of sometimes, you know, I, I, I've been known to be racially ambiguous. So I've been in spaces too where people have been very free with mm -hmm. their opinions and thinking that I was a different race, you know? And so that's been interesting too. Um, but as I kind of just navigated through, I think um, it became important to really just find that inner confidence um, and trust in myself. And that really did develop as I faced those things um, and realized who I was, you know, to make sure that you really have confidence and pride. Um, you know, we should be very, very proud of our roots. What we've gone through has been horrible, but we are just such a strong, rich, historically deep, profound culture and race. And that is something that I've been able to rely on. And that's helped through different periods of healing. Um, you know, healing is a continuous cycle. I wouldn't say it's perfect every day, but as long as I'm on that, that trail, you know, mm -hmm. slow and steady will win that race. So um, some things that I like to do um, is I do feel that as I've you know, gotten older, um, I've been more intentional. And so I have a, a diary I keep by my bed that I write three things that I'm thankful for every day. And that helps remind me of all the things, all the, all the bad stuff that's going on around me. But 
that my priority is on things because it could be worse. It could be worse, right? Um, I, I do try and dedicate some time, at least, you know, a few times throughout the week. Even It, it doesn't always have to be a long amount of time, um, but just something where I'm doing something for myself that I just enjoy, whether that's just scrolling through my, you know, Instagram or Twitter. I honestly get Twitter. That is, that is scary, okay? If you ever need a laugh, go on Twitter. Yeah, that, black, you, mean black, you mean black Twitter. Black Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Honestly, that has been my free therapy <laughs> Twitter. Okay, guys, <laughs> uh, um, we are ahead of the curve. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, All right. Watching something funny, listening to some good music, do something every day, every day. Just to speak on my, I guess, come into the understanding of my blackness. I mean, I think uh, we all, to me, I felt that uh, you always have that subconscious kind of understanding of what you should do and don't do, oh, you can do and shouldn't do. Um, like, uh, you don't do, don't do what those white boys are doing over there. You know, that might get you in trouble. Um, you know, act a little hard over here because, you know, they, people might, these black dudes might press you if you don't, you know, try to be a little bit more, you know, aggressive. So, you know, you, you kind of just learn and absorb and you just act. Um, but I think it was honestly um, in medical school, is where I feel like I had the most challenges to my sense of self that I've ever had experienced. Um, challenges to my sense of self-worth, value, my um, confidence, my intelligence, like all those things. And it, I mean, the, and honestly, it just boiled down to uh, the differences between me and the people around me who were not feeling, who were seeing the same things, you know, was the skin color. You know, and that that really just put it out on the forefront for me. Like, I, I see this is exactly what I have to navigate. And it's unfortunate because it, it, it really, as much as I enjoy the, um, the, the, you know, the position that I am in, I enjoy the profession. You know, it's, it's a beautiful profession, but the type of stuff, you know, I had to endure to go through it, you know, it just, it's, it's just, it gives, leaves you a bitter feeling, you know? And so uh, it, it's, it's, I think from that, it, it helped me to sort of grow and understand what is my, what is the purpose, what I need to really do to be right with myself. Because um, thankfully, you know, and unfortunately not many people do, but thankfully I was, a, where I was able to overcome um, a lot of these obstacles. Um, and I'm, I'm clear to the other side and I'm very proud of the position that I'm in right now. Uh, and, but you know, it's not, it, that's not the case for a lot of people. And I think what I've realized is that I have to be a person who can, um, bring a spotlight to that and show that this, this is something that can be overcome while telling people who are perpetrators of those type of environment, the toxicities and, the, um, the, the people who kind of allow these things to go to continue, you know, really making them very clear that they are in, implicit, I mean, they're complicit in a lot of these things. Um, and so I, I think I've, I've really accepted that for myself, you know, I'm trying to be more assertive about that, you know, having more faith and trust in my ability to do that. Um, and then, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, just how I move, I, I think I'm more intentional about being different, about being the type of black person that I think I need to be and not fitting a particular norm, stereotype, or fitting the, you know, whether it's the, the biased, you know, stereotype, you know, or being the good appearing, you know, good black ego. versus, exactly, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think um, I found, you know, what works for me and, I, and I, it, it brings happiness to me when I see that actually come and reflecting back to me. For example, and I'll, keep, I'll try to keep this brief, um, just the other day, another of the po positive things I try to do with myself, basketball, that's been my sort of in the ways my religion, um, outside of my, you know, me maintaining my spirituality. Um, you know, I try to maintain that for my physicality. And I, I play around with a lot of little kids who are at the core, you know. So I, I mean, I'm looking for good competition, but a lot of times you have these little kids around who want to play with you. So I, I engage. And um, I very, I, I always have this coaching mentality that I love to really work with the young kids and I'm always in that mentor role. And I, I happen to be doing that with one of the kids that I was playing with. And there, oh, my, my air piece is done right now, I'm sorry. Um, 
And so they, they asked me, are you a coach or something? I'm like, no. It's like, what? So what do you do? It's like, no, nah, I'm just, I just play. It's like, you are a different type of, you're not the average black guy. That's verbatim what he said. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I just laughed at that. It's like, okay, that's, that's different. That's different. But I, I, he, he took it in a way that it was positive, that you, you, you really want to see growth in the child around you. And you really try to emphasize that. And they take it and they appreciate it. And apparent, I mean, it's unfortunate that's not the thing that they used, they used to seeing. But mm. I am happy to be the one to try to encourage that. I think similarly to um, what's already been said, I kind of always knew that I was black to a certain extent. I grew up in areas that lacked diversity, um, not all the time, but in certain scenarios, especially academically. Uh, but I do think, again, medical school for me was probably the time where I was sitting in my pastor's office crying because the weight of everything I had went through, I didn't realize or acknowledge was a form of of taking on the collective trauma. And he looked at me and he said, from everything that I've heard you say, I need you to know that you don't have to be the sole representative of your entire people group. And I'm like, wow, like I didn't realize that that's what I was doing. So one, extending myself the grace to say, you know what? Like, it's okay if I'm five minutes late. I try to be on time all the time, but I can't like, you know, beat myself up because I was five minutes late because something happened, you know, um, that was outside of my circumstance. It's like excellence is just something that I carry, but it's not because I'm trying to prove that I'm worthy of being in a specific um, place. And I think also tying into it for me um, personally, like my faith kind of carries me for everything. So in that regard, it's knowing that I'm coming from a position that my identity is I'm already loved before I've done anything, I was already accepted before I you know, made a mistake or whatever, and that I belong in the places that I'm not because I've been placed there for a purpose and for a reason. And so I think anchoring my who I am outside of what society may say, or even the people who are around you, because sometimes your loved ones can't speak to um, who you are if they are also handling collective trauma, um, really helps. Um, so I think the, the first time that I knew that I was black was I recall I don't know, I guess maybe I was like four, someone telling me that they didn't want to play with me because I was black. Um, so that was the first thing. And then I, I actually mentioned this the other day about um, my mom. Um, we would often take trips as a family down to um, Florida um, and then other states sometimes up to Vermont. And we were sometimes when we're there, very, there are very few people of color in certain areas, okay? And I actually remember um, asking my mom why someone was staring um, at me. And my mom, which I love her response was, oh, cause I ain't never seen someone so beautiful. Okay, so it's, it was, um, I was like, dang, that's sad. <laughs> so, <laughs> not, like, and instead of, of um, very clearly what was going on of you're getting stared because y'all are just the only family, black family that's here at this facility. So that was that one thing. And then I love that my parents made sure I had a firm foundation with my schooling. I went to an all black private school from kindergarten through fourth grade, where I actually thought our national anthem was lift every voice and sing because we sang it every morning. Okay. Um, and, and Janelle actually mentioned eyes on the prize. That's what we watched on movie days. So I had a, 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 a level of, um, just black pride that was being just poured into me. And I truly appreciate that. And that took me through the hard times. And you guys have mentioned hard times later in life. I actually feel like my hard times came in in uh, uh, middle school and high school because my parents took me from that school and put me into another school where I was the only black girl in my class. And the first thing I remember someone um, was uh, someone asked me one time, one, if I tasted like chocolate, uh, two, someone else pulled my hair and uh, said uh, 1-800-CALL-AT&T, right? Um, so different things like that. So I- You might I, have to explain that one for the new oh, generation. Oh, the, know what that cord the, looked like. Thinking about the cord, the cord phone. Yeah, you said. And, and it had ring yeah. ringlets, right? So somebody pulling my, my ringlets, I had a flexi rod pulling my ringlets and, and making fun of it like it was a, a telephone. And I remember telling my mom, I didn't want to wear my hair like that anymore, right? So they started early, but my parents always like reminded me of, no, you are beautiful, you are smart. Um, basically, don't take on someone else's insecurities. 
And then the biggest thing, um, it, it goes back to kind of what Dr. Ann mentioned. Um, uh, you know, my parents are people of faith. So always reminding me of um, not only who I am, and I come from a very rich history, right, of my family, but whose I am, that I'm God's child. And so don't allow somebody else's no to be my no, because they don't have the final say. That's, that's the biggest thing um, that I could take away from my parents and things like that. So that's my spiel. Oh, how do I deal with it? Also, I surround myself with melanin. <laughs> every, I, every chance I get, I have fellowship with melanin. <laughs> I love it. And something um, I wish I wish she was on here. I wish Cindy was on here. But how our um, one of our groups really came about when we were at uh, Children's in Detroit. I made a point. Uh, me and Cindy became friends, and every single time we saw a black resident, we grabbed them. Okay, because it there is power and being surrounded by someone who knows what you're going through. And like uh, Ann was saying, you don't have to fully even explain to them, but they validate you and then lift you up and carry you through too when you can. So that's how I get through it. I get through it with y'all. Um, so kind of the same, I've always known. Um, I think what really grasped me um, was in med school when I realized how someone else may see my color and what that really meant to them. So I um, I was taking care of a black patient and their adoptive uh, family member was Caucasian. And they were uh, talking to me, trying to um, understand why that family member may go through some of the choices that they make and living at the status that they're, they're living. Um, being more of a poor status and what they're trying to get in aid and things like that. And um, saying that I should, you know, understand. And then they were like, oh, you know, actually I apologize. Uh, just because you're black doesn't mean you, you understand that. And it's just like, oh, this is where we were with why you're having this conversation with me is to get me to tell you why uh, your family member uh, may be doing some of these things because I must know. Um, and that was just, uh, that just really set really deep um, in my soul and <laughs> obviously still sits with me today um, that um, no matter what status I have, um, that's not going to change. Um, and even now, um, how people who don't look like me receive that I'm a physician, it's not well. My it family members yeah. have told me how. The cognitive no, dissonance it, for them, it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> It's like I just pooped on them. So I don't know. Like my family members are like, um, they don't believe me when I say this. And this is like, wow. Like, why are we still at this point? So um, it's um, for me, I probably don't do enough. You guys sound like you guys listen to great things that I should be doing to try and fill myself up a bit more. I have to take a little bit from everyone. Um, but I'm definitely um, leaning on my husband. He is definitely a great strength. He will write me a message on a mirror if he has to, to make sure that I am uplifted. So um, that is definitely where I get through uh, some of those tough times. Um, so I'm gonna piggyback uh, off of what you, uh, what you said. So I guess I'm gonna do like negative experience and a positive experience. So my negative experience kind of goes to what Dr. Emil had to say. Like back when I was like in college, I remember being racially profiled, uh, leaving the store. Uh, I'm leaving, uh, leaving the store just based on my color of my skin. So it didn't matter. I was a college student at the time. Didn't matter uh, um, doing exact, um, exactly what I was supposed to be doing. I fit the description. I was between five eight to six point two, uh, five eight to six two. I had on a gray jacket, had on a dark pair of jeans. Apparently, somebody robbed um, robbed the uh, robbed the store um, earlier that day, and we're just looking for people that fit the uh, fit the description. So I think that day I kind of realized that you know, even though it was great being black, black in high school and college, even in getting into a uh, you can say prestigious or even university. It's just like, what well, the people around me, what they looked at me, it was like, you know what? They didn't care about everything it took me to get there. It's just that if you didn't, I guess, didn't look like everyone was there, I was able to be pinpointed out. So it kind of like sat, it sat with me, even to this day, exactly like, what could I have done to change that cop's profession of just, of cop's opinion, just me just um, picking me out from there. So 
that's kind of sad with me. But a good experience, like when I actually identified being Black was happiest, was like in 2018. I got tickets to go to the new African American uh, African American Museum in Washington D.C. off Connecticut, Connecticut and 14th Street. Mm. And if you go inside, if you go inside, it's like eight floors. So like it starts from like beginning of like slavery all the way up to like modern day. And we get to the, so when you get to the top levels, you start to see black excellence in just everything: art, entertainment, music, academics, education, science. Just think about theater. There, just think about it. And you see black excellence in one building, and to me, just to see all that black house in just one one place, to me, kind of like you know what? If people that were marginalized to a degree that actually prevent their growth is able to achieve all this, there's nothing we can do. We put our minds to it. So. If anyone's in the area, I recommend going to that museum. I know there's one in Detroit, but I don't think it's as good as one in Washington, D.C. So again, if you can, maybe talk about <laughs> that. If not, I guess we'll go to one in Detroit. Yeah, I know a new Don Shade over here, okay? <laughs> very shady, very shady. Well, well done. Well Got done. Well done. I mean, I'll just add, I've been there and it's a beautiful place. So, I mean, I, and I've also been to the African-American one in Detroit, but I mean, it's, it, you got to see the Washington DC. All right, Dr. Janelle, bring us home. So, I just want to say, I really, really um, have loved tonight. Um, there's so many different jewels and tidbits um, and hopefully, you know, so many different things that you know, allow people to have those moments um, in all of our different stories where they can identify and have similar um, types of experiences. Um, so, you know, if you did definitely hit the like, you know, and subscribe button and follow us because we consistently are dedicated to having conversations like this. I think the other thing that I really um, want to share is that, you know, so much of my life, um, you know, African Americans have been defined as many different things, you know, but for me, you know, I've honed in on the idea that African Americans, when I think about us as a people, as, you know, um, Lauren, Dr. Lauren had mentioned is, you know, I feel like we are excellent against all odds. You know, we, you know, may not even have a bootstrap, but we gonna figure it out. And, and we gonna make a bootstrap so we can get up and then also turn back and help somebody else out and help the next generations out. You know, my church has a slogan that says, you know, uh, we do what we do uh, to honor the people who have gone before us and to make room and make way for the people, those who will come after us. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, that kind of thinking, you know, really drives us and you know, the question was, you know, well, when did I know I was Black? To be honest, I mean, I grew up in all Black spaces, um, frankly. Um, and that was from, you know, the age of zero to 18. <laughs> so there was, you know, I was born and raised in Harlem. I'm a Harlem baby. I, I had, you know, awesome, you know, um, Black teachers who just instilled in you that they believed in you and that you are excellent and that, you know, no matter what it was that you were doing, it may be different things, but you are going to reach your highest potential. Um, I think, you know, the idea of, um, you know, what we experience um, in a negative way um, and then what we experience in a positive way really deals with, you know, this is life, you know, um, and I think it also deals with the idea if I had one of my campus ministers at the University of Pittsburgh, shout out to, um, you know, Minister Gene Tibbs or Baba Gene Tibbs now, um, and one of his things that he challenged us with is understanding that God made you. And if you say that God made you and you really believe that, then that also means that God made you Black, even as um, Dr. Liz alluded to. And at, if we know, you know, as scripture talks about that God knows how to give good gifts, that he wanted to challenge us to think about, even with all of the things that society has thrown out at us and the false definitions, um, and as, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Imel said, the miscarriages of justice, you still must understand that being Black is a gift. All of our rich history is a gift. And that we, if we say that we want to change the world and God and following, you know, kind of the example of, of Jesus, you know, then you want to say that you need to start right here at home. Start with who you are the same way that Jesus did for his people. Um, 
So with all that said, I just say again, tonight has been beautiful healing. I echo everything that, you know, like I, you guys gave me great tidbits as well. I'm going to put a little notebook on my side of the bed, <laughs> like Dr. Lawrence, so I can do gratitude. Often I do like a mental rundown, um, but I think there is something powerful about writing things down. And I, I occasionally journal um, and just keeping your mind and your spirit intact, as we all have said. Very good. Very good. I love you guys and girls. <laughs> you got it. This is a, a wonderful talk. Um, you know, we went a little longer than usual, but I think, you know, it was, it, it's, it's what was needed. And, and to commemorate Juneteenth, um, I really hope we were able to put it in perspective for you and give context to, to why we celebrate this day and, and, and help to help you identify with who you are and who we are. And, you know, we touched on a lot of, a lot of sensitive topics. And so I always like to throw out resources. Um, and so if you or someone you know is in crisis, um, I encourage you to call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That number is 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Or you can text crisis text line, text the word hello, H-E-L-L-O, to 741-741. And so thank you. Um, I'd like to leave you with um, a quick quote from James Baldwin, Notes of a Native Son. He said, in the context of the Negro problem, neither whites nor blacks, for excellent reasons of their own, have the faintest desire to look back. But I think the past is all that makes the present coherent and further that the past will remain horrible for exactly as long as we refuse to assess it honestly. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you again for joining another installment of Black Docs Talks brought to you by Young Black Physicians. And I hope you all have